Jess with Emotional Fire Academy here to talk to you today about highly sensitive person treatment part two. So this is a continuation of last week's video. If you haven't seen that, definitely go check it out before you start this one. It'll totally make more sense. I'll put that link above right now. And subscribe to my channel if you are a highly sensitive person who looks forward to weekly tips, tricks, and tools because that's what I provide on this channel at Emotional Fire Academy. And who am I? I am Jess. Welcome to my channel. I am a former firefighter. I am a master NLP practitioner and I am your guide on this journey to evolve your sensitivity. So that's what we talk about on this channel because I love talking about it. <laughs> So uh, this is a continuation again. So last week, very, very brief, brief recap. Seriously, if you haven't seen the video, go back and watch it. It's 25 minutes worth of value packed information coming at treatment from a different perspective. So I kind of showed you how, you know, we can go through very superficial changes if we're trying to be a different type of highly sensitive person, right? If we have a what we perceive to be a problematic relationship with our sensitivity. What are our options for treatment? How do we fix this? How do we change? How do we become better? There's superficial changes that we can make and there's also really, really deep, deep changes. And the deepest one we can make is on the identity level. And that is where we're going to go today. And I intend this video to be a little bit shorter than the last week's because last week's was quite long. So thanks for bearing with me on that one. This one is going to be a little more philosophical, a little shorter, but still super important. So watch to the end make sure you stick with me to the end to get all the information. And sorry, my nose is super itchy right now. Um, anyway, so we're talking about, I want to talk about personas and identity. All right. So, and this, so a persona is, a perceptual location in our consciousness. A persona is a flavor of you, right? It is a place that you go to. I actually, I have it as a sensation, as a, as an actual place. Like when you feel yourself shift into a persona, you actually feel like you've shifted into a different place in your consciousness. And this makes a difference because if we start to think about it as having to do with distance, having to do with location, it helps us to kind of parse our experience and to say, well, I was that persona. I'm not that persona now, right? It, we, it starts to play into how we explain things and stories, which we're going to get to <laughs> stories. It helps us tell our story better, more accurately. So a persona is a place, a flavor of ourselves that we then shift into. We use personas all the time. Everybody uses personas, right? A persona is a different flavor of you. Um, when you're angry, you're a different persona. When you're happy, you're a different persona. When you are with uh, certain people, like your parents, you act a certain way than you do when you're with your friends, right? You'll say things differently around your parents than you would with your friends. Um, your work self versus your home life self. We use these personas. They're kind of an adaptive mechanism to adjust to the situation, to the circumstance, or to show up in a certain way to accomplish a certain goal, right? So when a firefighter puts on their firefighter persona, actually it's more of an identity, um, when they put that uniform on, they're changing personas. You know, when we use, we use uniforms to create a persona, a persona is just a flavor of you. And some of the flavors can be very subtle, right? The difference between you, content versus happy. You know, content versus happy. They can be subtle or they can be really extreme. <clears throat> you know, the difference between let's say chocolate and vanilla, <laughs> the difference between happy and angry, the difference between some people have very big differences between their work selves and their home life self, their personal self, you know? So these flavors are what we use on a daily basis. And when you step into a persona, when you assume a persona, um, it changes your role as both receiver and actor, right? So if you think about it, 
when you're physically standing in a different location on Earth, it also changes your perception as a receiver and an actor. So when you're standing there, not only does the view look different, the sounds could be different, but then how you act is also different because you're getting different information, you're receiving different information from that point of view, from that perspective, and so then you can act differently. You can act on that information. And now bear with me here. You're probably saying, what does this have to do with treatment? I'm getting to it. This is, this is part of the understanding and the awareness that we're building so we can understand what our treatment options are and how we can change on our own and go through this process on our own without looking to very superficial or traditional methods of changing ourselves. Um, but we can make an internal change that's much more um, permanent and quick and intentional, intentionally changing. So personas are the flavors of you that you use on a daily basis. And then what is your identity? Your identity is the ice cream shop. <laughs> this is the actual, the through practice, through habitual going to that persona, you've built this kind of what appears to be this solid identity. There's the solidity that we kind of try to create in saying, this is who I am. This is my identity. But really, it's just a persona that we use over and over again. It's our home base persona. It's our ice cream shop, the structure that we've created around all of the flavors of us that are all the flavors of ice cream inside. <laughs> And we come back to it and we perceive it as like, this is my identity. This is who I am. It feels familiar. It feels comfortable because we've practiced it. We've practiced it. But who, what is the real, what is the bigger reality of our human potential is that we're not just the flavors or the ice cream shop. We're everything. We're everything beyond that. We're every ice cream shop ever built or that could be built. And so from a human potential standpoint, I want you to realize that you can be any of this. And so when you think about high sensitivity, what is, you know, what is the persona that you use? The persona is the more temporary, you know, stepping into that. The identity is the more permanent, you know, the habitual persona that you keep using, the one that you consider to have solidity, the one that you keep, you know, is my home base persona. Um, you know, because when we think about this stuff, like, <laughs> what is, what is the, what is the persona that you use or the personas that you've been using for being a highly sensitive person? And that's where we kind of need to, or the identity that you've created. If you're, if you've been in the HSP world for a while, you maybe have created this identity of this, these very rigid, this is what HSP is. This is what HSP is because of the experts say it, because you know, you've created the story. Let's get into story. What is story? Um, so the story is the verbal account of where we are in our consciousness that we then believe and make reality. All right. This is so good. I want to tell it to you again. The story is the verbal account of where we are in our consciousness that we then believe and make reality. So when you tell yourself, and a story is the structure that we're all used to, right? We, we grew up hearing stories, believing stories, making up our own stories. And so when someone tells a story, when we tell ourselves a story, we're giving a language, we're putting language to the location that we are in our consciousness. And so that plays into, again, suggestibility. And because we're telling ourselves that story, we're listening, we're hearing the story as we tell it. And so then we're believing it. And then that's what our conscious, that's what our physical reality then reflects. And so, because Ultimately, we don't know the nature of reality. We have no idea. All we have is our senses, the information coming into our senses, and then the stories that our brain is generating, right? The predictive stories that our brain creates. I mean, our poor little brain is trapped in a skull. It can't see, hear, feel, taste, or touch. It relies upon our senses to do that for us. And then it makes these stories to try and explain everything. 
<laughs> I mean, it's it's this organ that is locked in this bony <laughs> cave and it can't, it doesn't know. It only relies on our senses. And we know the information from our senses is sometimes skewed. We, you know, we filter it, we notice things, we don't notice other things. So then the story is the account, language-wise, of where we are. So remember when I talk about, you know, when we ha adopt that persona, we then tell a story. So we step into the persona physically in our consciousness, we've assumed a location, and then we, then the language starts coming out. I'm angry. I'm so pissed off. I'm so pissed off because this person did this to me, because this is what happened, because I'm an angry person, because blah, 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 blah. This is huge storm of story of language that we believe and then becomes our reality, right? If we, so, and story is just kind of how we explain pretty much everything. We have stories about everything. We, what is fact? You know, what is fact? Fact to us is the story that feels good. It's the story that feels good. This feels good to me. Thus, I believe it and I incorporate it and be make, it be make it who I am. Um, but because the ultimate, what is the ultimate truth of reality? And I go back to that analogy, like, we don't actually know. This could all be a hologram. We could all be in a computer program. We could be, this could all just be a giant ant farm and we're just little puppets <laughs> of some greater, like, who knows what, what is actually happening. All we have is our inner experience, you know? All we have is what we can perceive with our senses and then the stories we cre create to make meaning of all of the p bits and pieces that we get. We don't actually, we can't know for sure. But how we create the illusion of knowing for sure is with our stories. We, we explain things, we're like, okay, this is how it happened, this is what it means, and thus that's the reality that I am going to create in my mind, in my body, and then have reflected in my outer experiences. So, when it comes to treatment, let's, let's tie all this interesting stuff together. Um, let's tie all this together. Okay, how does this, how, when we're thinking about treatment, how do we use this to treat being a highly sensitive person? Well, first we need awareness. I'm bringing you the awareness right now of maybe this, you know, overarching, I'm telling you a story. I am essentially telling you a story right now. If it makes sense to you, that's awesome. If it's going to help you, awesome. If it's going to help you step into a, a slightly different persona of where you are. And again, our personas can be very subtle shifts of thinking of things this way and trying on the story and saying, okay, I'm going to subscribe to this and see if I can play with it and actually make it work for me. And then if it does, that's the whole point, right? The whole point is to feel better. The whole point is to feel empowered. The whole point is to tell stories we actually enjoy and believe and then have that experience of. Because if our stories are crappy and sad and that's where all of that emotional, the negativity in our emotions comes from too. And then our body suffers from feeling crappy and sad. And, and so how do we treat our sensitivity with this? How do we, there's three different ways to approach this. I mean, there's probably thousands of ways, but here's three I'm going to throw out for you right now because <laughs> this video is marching on. Um, <clears throat> practice telling another story. Practice telling another story about your sensitivity. Why not practice? I mean, what you've been told about being a highly sensitive person is all, it's all theoretical, right? It's all, you know, what the scientists, you know, God bless them. They have their, you know, they think that they're speaking the, the truth with a capital T, but that's just their story. That's what they found evidence for. The reality might be bigger than that, right? The reality is bigger than that. And so start telling a different story about what sensitivity means to you. That's, like I said, I've mentioned in other videos that I call it being a super sensor. I am a super sensor. I created a new word, right? Language, again, is this part of this new story I'm telling. I am a super sensor. And these are the qualities of a super sensor. And this is what I experience. And as you tell that new story and believe that new story, you're 
you are giving a verbal account of your new either persona or identity. And it's okay to start with a persona. It's okay to be like, okay, this is a sense of separation. Like I'm trying this on. Eventually it will harden into my identity. You know, it's okay to start small. It's okay to start temporary. It's okay even in your imagination. You know, start with what would me as an empowered, highly sensitive person look like? What would it feel like, right? Imagination is where we create these personas. That's where it starts. So start there. Start telling a different story. That's one way to start shifting your relationship with your sensitivity. Way number two, go find evidence of someone living a better story and see what they did. Go look for evidence of empowered, highly sensitive people and listen to their accounts, right? Gather, that's part of the gathering of evidence, right? You're, this helps you believe the story. If you're like, well, that person did it and this is what they did and if I do it, then I am that too, right? This is part of taking the story, believing a new story, and then incorporating it into our own lives. And then the last step we can do, the last thing we could try, these are all just approaches to try, are disidentifying with the old story. Now this one, I have personal experience with. I used to think, I used to believe the story that when you get rid of something, you have to replace it with something else. I don't know if that's true anymore. I think there's a power in disidentifying with something and then sitting in the calm and the peace that results from that, in the nothingness. And not feeling you have to, like, you have to stuff something else in there to replace it. You can just enjoy the expanse of eliminating a behavior. Or a story. Or a persona. And so... I actually did this when I was 14 inadvertently with lactose intolerance. Now, uh, my mother and my brother and I were all really, really lactose intolerant. <laughs> we had a horrible time with cheese and dairy. And instead of reinforcing the story that I was lactose intolerant to, that I was experiencing, you know, tummy upset, I loved cheese so much I was not about to give it up. And so I just stopped identifying with that story. I didn't, I didn't reiterate it to anyone. I didn't, that wasn't an identity I wanted to pick up. I just was like, I enjoy this and I'm going to eat it. And, and so I literally, my body just started digesting dairy because I wasn't identifying with, oh, I attribute this tummy upset or this GI upset to the dairy. And to this day, like, I don't have any problems with being lactose intolerant. Uh, my family still is. <laughs> so it's interesting how, and you might think, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's one thing. Well, I've done this on many occasions with my body in other circumstances where, um, again, I had a really bad shoulder injury. I was told the only way to fix this is surgery, that you've literally ripped one of the muscles in your shoulder clean off the bone and so your shoulder will be unstable for the rest of your life and unless you do surgery and I simply decided to disidentify with this I'm like this is not my story I refuse to pick this up I refuse to I believe it and so you can kind of do that too with being a highly sensitive person you can take the parts of the story that you don't enjoy about being a highly sensitive person and stop identifying with it you can totally do this. So let me know. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And I hope this help, helped you. If you are a highly sensitive person who is ready to shift, I have an excellent three-month journey where we're going to do just that with you. It's called Flammable to Fireproof. Uh, grab your free consultation on my website. That is going to be, my free consultations are going to be going away very soon. <laughs> so um, go ahead and grab those before they're gone. Uh, that's at emotionalfireacademy.com. And I hope this helped you. Let me know what you think, uh, where you use personas and identity, um, the power of story and what it's playing in your life. I really love engagement and I respond to all comments on my YouTube channel. So yes, thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day. Later.